To have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200 inch buck? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So this week on the podcast, I have on Ryan Muncy. So Ryan and I have become friends. We have a mutual friend in Mike Lum. And so uh, we've been able to, to hang out together. And uh, I read his book, which I really like. Uh, it's F Your Feelings, just this, this great book on uh, human performance and optimization. And uh, has this great section on mental toughness. And so uh, this year when he was coming out to Montana to hunt elk, we teamed up together and got after it. Um, this is like late season tactics. So it's post rut. Uh, it, it's unconventional. It's, it's maybe not the peak rut hunt that you're used to hearing. And, and so we use some different tactics in this one and, uh, we cover that in the podcast. It was, uh, uh good fun, like reliving the hunt and, uh, some of the adventures we had in close calls. And then, uh, he was here when I killed my bull, helped me pack it out. And, uh, so yeah, just really fun to relive it. And, uh, I, I really like Ryan. Ryan wrote that book, F Your Feelings, that I really enjoy. Uh, they also have a company called Fuel the Pursuit where they make backcountry meals. We chat about that a little bit. And uh, they also offer an online course. Uh, it's a uh, like a, a preparing for a Western hunt course. Uh, they've got a great section on mental toughness in that one as well. Uh, working out and just the mindset needed. And, and uh, Ryan's applied all this this human performance and optimization into his Western hunting. And so I uh, really enjoy hanging out with him and hunting with him and uh, enjoyed this podcast. And I think you guys will too. I want to thank our sponsor for today's show, Sig Sauer Optics. Sig Sauer is just building great optics for, for great value. I'm so impressed by these. Um, I've been using their standard binos now for the last handful of seasons. Uh, they've got a pair of 11 by 45s, which are just great around the chest, uh, great in low light, great glass, crisp, clean. Uh, they also have a pair of 15 by 56s. Those things tripoded up are a game changer just for glassing distant terrain and uh, picking apart details. Uh, they spotted a bunch of animals and created a bunch of stocks for me. Uh, also this year I found their image stabilization binos. Those things have been a game changer. They have a 10 by 32 and they have a 15 by 45s, uh, 16 by 45s. And uh, those things, they just, uh, you flip the switch on them and it stabilizes the image. So it's like you're glassing from a tripod, but you can be coming up over a windy ridge, picking things apart, and you just tend to see more details and pick out more animals. Uh, and they don't break the bank either. Uh, I also like that those pair of 16s are lightweight. Uh, pretty much always have them in the pack for uh, when I sit down on a master vantage point, And uh, they've created a lot of opportunities for me as well. Uh, I also really enjoy their scope. I mean, it holds up to the to the best scopes out there. Uh, it's got great glass, great low light capabilities. It's a um, see, it's a 80 mil objective lens on it, uh, and then it's a uh, like a 20 by 56, um, and and you can really glass distant terrain, pick things apart. Great for field judging. Uh, really enjoy looking through that scope. Uh, they also build the best rangefinders on the market. Uh, they just came out with a brand new rangefinder that I use this season. Uh, usually I like the, the last target priority mode. On this one, I like the best target priority mode, but does incline, decline, uh, has the BDX system in them, which uh, uh, built a rifle this year that's got a scope that connects with the BDX system. Uh, so my scope, talks to my rangefinder uh, all through an app on my iPhone and gives me the exact hold and um, just a, a great program. So if you're in the market for any new optics, make sure to check out Sig Sauer and everything they're putting out. Make sure to check out everything we're doing over at Eastman's. Uh, we've got Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal, Eastman's Hunting Journal. Uh, if you put in the promo code ELEVATED321, you'll get both magazines for $50 and an outdoor edge knife. Uh, we've got a bunch of articles in there. The MRS section is great. Uh, members research section, uh, just gives information on every state and it's timely before the draws. And so you can really look in there and, um, gather information on what are the blue chip units, green chip units, 
and, and also some other opportunities like over the counter and things of that nature. Uh, we've also compiled all this data in an internet research tool called Eastman's Tag Hub. Uh, you can check that out for this season. Uh, uh, this information has really helped me over the years figure out the opportunities in all these different states uh, to be able to know where the good units are, where to apply for, and uh, has helped me draw some really good tags and uh, harvest some great animals. So make sure to check that out. Uh, check out uh, uh, Beyond the Grid. It's our internet uh, uh, TV show that's done on YouTube. Uh, you can also check us out on the Outdoor Channel, Eastman's Hunting TV. Uh, I've got a bunch of episodes that are going to be coming out here, so I'll make sure to to cue you guys in when, when they are being released so you can check them out. Uh, really proud of some of the work that I put together and uh, can't wait to see the finished product. So with that, uh, yeah, just um, into the off season here for me, but uh, having a good time researching units and the hunts I want to do and uh, getting in my training, cold weather training, and uh, uh, I've been running and lifting and doing all the necessary stuff Uh uh, to, to make myself successful in 2022, I couldn't be more excited for another season. Uh, also catching up on some work and um, uh, some family time as well. We just took a family vacation, which was great. Uh, so really enjoying spending time with them and um, getting back into getting back into normal life, getting ready for next hunting season. So uh, it's been great preparing, but I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Ryan's a great guy, really well-spoken, intelligent and uh, just made for a great conversation. So I hope you guys enjoy it. This is Eastman's Elevated. I'm your host, Brian Barney. Here we go. Hey, what's happening? Hey, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing good. Congratulations on that whitetail. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Dude, that thing was uh, pretty. Dude, he was gorgeous. Um <laughs> It's funny. That's actually the biggest buck I've ever killed. Um, I, I just, I, I, I don't let anything walk past me. <laughs> and uh, I've just, uh, I don't know, man. It, it, it was cool. Um, I did get that one with a rifle, but uh, killed three already this year. And the other two were with my bow. Um, wow. Good so, for you. Bow shooting. It is, man. Um it's, uh, I think I sent you the, the one picture. It was like a week after I got back from being out there with you. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a pretty good season here so far. Um, but man, I just, I want to get one of those elk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, well, you've been, you've been hunting whitetails for a while now, but yeah, you're just so hooked on yeah. that, that Western game. And, um, it's one of the things that uh, I really like about you, Ryan. Like you've gone all in on Western hunting, and you've got this drive and this passion for it, and you're like out getting the experience that's necessary to improve your skill sets. Yeah, man, it's been a blast, and I mean, it's uh, I mean to have guys like Mike and you, and you know some of the other folks that I've been able to you know team up with, you know, helping me and teaching me, and you know, just kind of you. Know, it does shorten the learning curve, but it also makes it more fun too, you know? Um, so it's been, uh, it's been a really cool experience to just dive into it. Well, and also you're like, just, you're, um, you're transposing like a lot of your knowledge that you've gained in life, like a, a lot of your fitness knowledge and, and a lot of the things that have allowed you to get to the top of your game. Like you're just applying that to Western hunting and putting everything into it, you know? So you're going to see nothing but dividends in the future, you know, pay off for your hard work. But yeah, you did, you did, um, three elk hunts this year, right? I didn't get to hear how the last one went. Yeah, I had uh, three elk tags this year, and uh, it, it was wild because I knew that I was going to have one, which was my, it, it, it was like chronologically my third tag. It was a, um, it was a cow tag, Colorado third rifle. Um, and the other two, I actually, uh, those were archery hunts that I went on. I didn't expect to have those or go on those hunts. Um I actually, at the beginning of this year, like, you know, during, I guess we call it like tag season, right? Um, I was planning to actually go to New Mexico, um, and uh, a buddy of mine was going to hook me up with an outfitter. Um, but long story short, that fell through, and I kind of realized that it was going to fall through in June. 
And then that still gave me enough time to jump on the alternate list in Montana and then jump on the secondary draw in Colorado. And those were both just kind of like Hail Marys. And ended up, I got both of those tags. And uh, and so the one in, the archery hunt in Colorado was with Mike and uh, and his brother. He was going to be out there with his brother and um, they were going to take horses and, and just, you know, uh, hunt this unit that his brother had hunted a few times. And my buddy Zach actually came out and he spent a week with me um, before Mike and his brother got out there. And then, of course, the... Um, the alternate tag, I got lucky, and I think my number was like 74 in Montana. So as soon as I knew that that was my number, I knew I was going to get a phone call. Um, and so that was the one where you and I teamed up. And then the third one was this um, third rifle hunt in Colorado. And man, that's the one we haven't talked about. And, and, and it was um, – it's a really hard unit. Um, it's an over-the-counter unit. There are a ton of elk. Um, it's part of the White River herd. And – to my knowledge, it's, it's the biggest herd in Colorado. Um, so, you know, seeing elk isn't the issue, but at that point, uh, the issue is finding elk in the daylight on public land. And, uh, I think there was only one day where we didn't see elk. Um, but most of the time when we saw them, they were on private and, uh, and they cross uh, over into public, um, at night. And, you know, you just, you, you've got these very small windows of opportunity to try to catch them crossing, um, you know, right, right at first light or, or, you know, right at uh, last light. And, um, you know, we made, made a lot of great plays and, and I mean, we had fun. Um, we didn't get any elk. Um, I actually don't, I think, I think there were a few, like we saw a few people that actually got elk, but not a lot um, for the amount of hunters and the amount of pressure. Um, that's in that unit. We didn't see a lot of people. Um, we did see a lot of people uh, getting deer. Um, and two of the buddies that I was hunting with had uh, doe deer tags as well. And so both of them actually got um, mule deer doe. Um, so, I mean, we weren't totally shut out, but uh, it was um, it, it was an interesting hunt. Um, it wasn't as cold as we were expecting it to be and there wasn't any snow on the ground. So, um, you know, that always makes it a little bit trickier when, you know, you're hunting that, you know, it's, it's third rifle and you're expecting them to be kind of, um, you know, doing their, their migration and, you know, down. Um, so, um, yeah, it was fun. Um, uh, but no elk still haven't gotten that elk. Yeah, you will. It's coming, man. Um, that, uh, the, the rifle season, like um, a lot of times you think it'd bring better odds or it gives you an extended range, you know, and so it gives you a good chance to be able to close a deal on an elk. But rifle season comes with a whole new set of challenges. There's a, a lot more guys out there, a lot more hunting pressure. You're hunting those elk at really tough to hunt seasons, which is post rut. And um, those those elk um, in those high pressure units, they really adapt to that pressure. They learn those spots where they can get away from it. And, and, you know, the deal is, is a lot of times those spots, they're refuging on private ground, especially when you've got a lot of public land hunting. So it comes with a whole new set of challenges. So even though, you know, you're really good and really capable with your rifle, and now you've built your elk hunting skill set to where you're good at finding elk, well, well, now the challenge is finding them on public ground. It just comes with this whole new set of challenges, you know, it seems like. It really does. And, you know, I think the, the very first year that I hunted, I was out in Montana with Mike and, and we just did rifle <clears throat> for that exact reason, right? The, the thought process being that it extends your effective range. And, um, you know, the last two years, you know, last year I was able to do some archery uh, hunting for elk. And then this year I had the two archery hunts. And um, it, it's funny, you know, I'm talking about the whitetail hunting here and, and just, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm carrying my rifle and sometimes I'm my bow and, um, you know, I was, I was out there last night actually with just my bow. I didn't even take the rifle, um, even though I could still hunt here with the rifle and it just, man, it, there's just something about being out there with the bow in your hand. It just feels totally different. And, you know, the, 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 the expectation, the, the, you know, trying to get close and, um, 
it's just it's totally different and i know you know what i'm talking about i know your audience does too i mean you, that's your audience is next level bow hunters and so they wouldn't be listening to this if that wasn't what they loved you know for for their own hunts and pursuits and um i mean i i can totally understand not hunting with a rifle at all um I don't know that I'm there yet, but man, just there's nothing like being out there with a bow in your hand. Man, that's right. Well, and, and um, rifle season is another chance to to gain information and to gain knowledge and to further that skill set, you know. So yeah, in my younger years, like I learned a lot of good lessons hunting rifle season, you know, and hunting these high pressure elk. And so, like, I think it's good. Um, you know, everybody has to make their own decision, you know, how they want to hunt and and what they enjoy. But I think it's good when you take advantage of the different seasons and different weapons and like you're hunting elk in different times of year and different weather conditions. But just like you stated on that last hunt, um, you know, especially like a third season rifle or like hunting rifle down here in Montana, like that, that weather is such a difference maker, you know, the cold and the snow, it makes those elk feed out longer. It uh, pushes them down out of the mountains onto the faces and, and you got to see firsthand like this year when we teamed up, what a, what a real mountain snowstorm does to the elk. Oh my gosh. Uh, people have been telling me for three years, I need to be out there when it happens. I need to see it. You won't believe it. And, um, like you said, I actually got to see it this year and it, it was, you know, it's one of those things where you have to see it to believe it. Like, had I not experienced that? I mean, it's not that I don't believe people, but man, it was, um, it, it really did change things in a way that, um, and it's just amazing. I mean, I know, you know, that morning, that you know they were having the party was the last morning that i was out there hunting you know with with you and um so i think that was a wednesday and the snow actually came on monday and you know we were hoping that by the time it cleared off that that we would find that party on tuesday and, and we didn't it took a little bit you know longer um but we actually had split up on wednesday morning and, and i went and i was sitting um on a spot where we were hoping to catch them coming from private because that snow had pushed them so low that they were actually on private. Um, and I was on a spot of public trying to catch them at, right at daybreak and, and that didn't play out. And then I drove down, uh, and was, you know, it, it, we'd had great service all week. And that was the one day, of course, you know, we didn't have cell phone service and, uh, you know, we found out after the fact that we're both trying to text each other at the same time, but the texts weren't going through, but you know, you had, tried to call me and text me and tell me like, Hey, you found the party and they're here and I'm doing the same thing and I'm texting you. And, and I just, I remember my text saying like, I found them, they're on this space and, and it is literally crawling with elk. Like it, it is just crawling. Like the image in my head is like some movie where, you know, you see these like bugs that take over and they're just, they're just covering a floor or a table or something. And, and I've never seen that many elk and, from what you had told me after the fact that, you know, you, you got there about an hour, hour and a half before I did. And there were probably twice as many when you first saw them. Yeah. Oh man. They, um, they piled out of the mountains and, and we found elk before the storm. We actually had pretty good hunting before the storm. You know, we were getting on elk and, um, and getting on elk in different places, but yeah, that snowstorm definitely shook things up. And yeah, I, I kept telling you the entire hunt, like, boy, when this storm hits, you know, they're going to show up here and they're going to show up there and they're going to be all over. And, and, um, and then the day after the snowstorm, it cleared me and you went out and, um, you know, we didn't find that many or we didn't find them where we could hunt them there. They didn't pile out like I, like I thought they would. And we ended up burying the truck in a snow drift and digging for a couple hours and, um, having a real rodeo in that, in that snow drift. But it was a day later and they showed up on every face and every spot in that mountain range. And, and luckily, you know, we weren't able, able to keep in touch, um, you know, through text, but luckily we had been, you know, running the program of where we were looking for these elk and what we were looking for. And we had been on elk earlier in the hunt, like on these faces. And so like, man, you just, um, you went right to the spot, spotted those elk, and then you started playing on them. And man, I mean, you played on them there for a couple hours and got some good stalks and then trailed them into the timber and heard them bugling. And man, that was just action. 
And it really was. Um, and, you know, even after we finished packing years out, we went back in and, and we almost had, um, you know, that, that play right at last light. And um, I mean, I, I think, I don't, I don't think we could actually count. We couldn't, we couldn't get a clear visual. So even then we don't know exactly how many there were, but there were, you know, a handful of bulls, maybe three, four, uh, and they were less than 50 yards away, but it was just, you know, the, the timber was so thick and, you know, the snow was a little crunchy and like, we were kind of, it, it was just one of those things where like we couldn't make a move and we didn't know where they were coming and they just, they didn't present the shot. But I mean, that whole day from, you know, the moment that we could see in the morning until we couldn't see, uh, at night, um, you know, we were in them and, um, that was a, that was a really special day. Oh man, was it ever? Yeah, that was wild. That was some good action. But we we did have good hunting all week, and we got plays on elk. They're just tough to kill with a bow and arrow, you know. We even had we had some good stocks and um, good opportunities that just didn't come together for us. Um, they're they're just they're difficult. Like their their instincts are keen, and to get that close with the bow and arrow, like um, you you just fail like a like a handful of times just trying to get the right situation or get them in the right place um but man we sure had some good action you know we really did and i think um uh, i guess maybe pull the curtain back a little bit on on podcasting um you know you and i tried to record this um together before i had to jet out of town and you know technology didn't cooperate so um i, I think uh when we recorded the first time, I think, you know, our intention, you know, was to actually kind of recap some of those lessons learned. And, and I think, you know, um, it, it kind of leads right into, you know, what you're talking about. And, you know, I think one of the things that you said uh, all along, you know, leading up to that week of, of me coming out there was, you know, we just got to find them, right? Like to, to kill an elk, you have to be in the elk. Right. And so that's step one. And, and I think, um, you know, that, that was our play from day one. Um, so that first day of, of my hunting out there was Thursday and you weren't able to team up with me, but you did some glassing that morning. Um, and I went to a separate place to try to, you know, see if they were bugling or see if I could, you know, turn any up with the glass. And I did hear some bugling before the sun came up, um, but I was never able to, you know, see anything. Um, and then I went to that vantage point and didn't see anything. And then, you know, got back in touch with you and, and you told me that you had spotted some. And, and then, you know, from that day and, and through, you know, day two and day three, it was kind of a, okay, what, what's the elevation band, right? Like, are they, you know, how high are they? And, and what's the, you know, you have to get to at least this elevation to find them. And then if you get above this, you know, then, then we're not seeing them. And then, you know, being able to transpose that across, the entire hunt area, um, you know, and so even if we were on a different face or, or in a different range, different side of the valley, just kind of knowing, okay, here's that elevation band. And, and once we pin that down, like you said, we were, um, we were able to find elk every single day. I think there was only one day that we weren't inside of a hundred yards of elk. Um, and, and yeah, like you said, it's just, just because you're that close doesn't mean you're going to get them. And, um, I forget it was maybe the the third day you know we were making a play up that one face in the evening and there were maybe 20 or 30 elk up at the top and you know as we were kind of circling around keeping some terrain between us and them uh, you know we look up and, and there's another 20 you know over here on on this you know hillside to our left and you know now all of a sudden we're pinned down and you know, we can't move because this one's going to see us and you know, we can't get to this other group over here. And it's just, um, it, it was, <laughs> I mean, it's, you want to, it's not frustrating, but I mean, you know, you say like, oh man, we just want to be in the elk and then <laughs> you got to be careful what you ask for. Right. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. Be careful. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. It's like, um, uh, there's always going to be challenges on a hunt, and sometimes it's finding the elk, but sometimes it's finding them, and then it's trying to kill them, trying to get close enough to to kill them. And um, yeah, you're right. Like uh, uh, that's a really good point you brought up. Like um, you have to you have to be into elk to kill elk, and so we 
spend a lot of our time like trying to uh, with focused intensity to try to put ourselves into those elk because um, they're not spread out throughout the mountain range. You know, these elk are, are nomadic and work this network of, of feeding features and bedding features. And and um, so, you know, you can go hike back in the mountains and go do 20 miles and not run into an elk. Or like you with with focused intensity, you find these vantage points or, you know, and we used a lot of glassing from afar, too, where a lot of times we were glassing five to ten miles away where we were just glassing the range, just trying to locate some elk. And then once we found them, we'd go hike into them. And and you had mentioned that first day how we split up and I had found a handful of elk glassing from afar and I had to go work that day. And so, like, I relayed the message to you. And, and my message was, you know, hey, I don't know what kind of bull's in here. Like, I saw a handful of cows on this saddle, so I know there's some elk in here. And it is the rut. You know, I think there'll be some bull around and so uh you made the hike in there and it's a it's a big climb in there like uh i i I threw you straight into the fire like it was like i uh i said yeah oh i got some elk by the way you're gonna need some waiters stop by my place get some waiters because you gotta cross this uh this creek to get over there and then from there i mean that thing goes straight up but um you you were all in on this hunt like you had already been on that previous bow hunt and you were so hungry to put forth full effort to try to arrow one of these elk and so you know you went in there and you had one of your best close calls with this mega bull that we ended up seeing later and ended up targeting later in the season or whatever uh, or later in that hunt but man that was a great bull you caught up there and and almost killed him that day oh my gosh so (laughs) there's so much to talk about on that one i still have i took a screenshot when you sent me the text because uh it was just so funny um so you sent two waypoints one was like you know this is kind of the the opening where i saw them and then you know, if I were you, I would try to work to this second point so that you can, you know, hopefully, you know, have a close vantage point and look into, you know, that opening. And then the next text was what you just said, like, you're going to need waiters to cross the creek, stop by the house and you can get some. And so I just, I took a screenshot of that because like you said, it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, all right, like, you know, get your big boy pants on and like, get your mind right. Cause you know, there's a reason that, that an elk that big lives where it does. And you know, when you looked at it on, on X and you just do like a straight line, you know, it was like 1.2 miles from, you know, where the car was parked. But, you know, like you said, you, you've got to put waders on and cross this creek. There's not a bridge. Um, and then once you get across, um, I think the next day we went further up and we gained like 3,500 feet um, to get to like the top the next day. Right. And so a about where that elk was was probably you know a thousand feet lower so it's still 2500 vertical feet in about a mile maybe less at that point once you cross the creek so um it's not easy to get there and uh yeah it's funny i've got a buddy who um, is a a bodybuilder he's like a bodybuilding coach one of the best in the world and and we grew up together and and used to be listening partners And, and he always makes this joke of you know, when, when people come to him as a client and they tell him like, you know, I'll do anything you tell me like to be successful, like whatever it takes, if you tell me, I'll do it. He's like, all right. So if I tell you to eat rocks, are you going to eat rocks? And people are like, no. And so like, like you, you talk about like being hungry, like at that point, like if you had told me like, Hey, like you got to chew on rocks while you climb this hill, like, I would have done it. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, it, I mean, I got up to that, um, that, that gland, uh, that vantage point. And, um, it, it, that was a weird weather day. I mean, the, it was like, um, a little bit overcast and it would get, um, you know, rain. And so I must've changed clothes like three times trying to get to the top. <laughs> you know, I had to put the waders on and then take them off and then I get everything back geared up and I'm hiking and then it starts dumping rain. And, you know, I put on all my rain gear and, you know, walking up a hill in rain gear, no matter how good the gear is, like you're just, you're dumping sweat, um, you're overheating. And, uh, and so like, I'm just holed up under the tree about halfway up waiting on the rain to pass. And then I take the rain gear off and, and I get to the vantage point right as like all the clouds are finally blowing out and I'm looking through the binoculars and, you know, this clearing is about 200 yards away, maybe less. 
and I just see this huge mass and I'm like, you know, big bush or whatever. And, and then all of a sudden I'm like, Oh my God, that's not a bush. That is an elk. And it is bedded down. Like you saw the, the spot where it was bedded down the next day. And I mean, and I think you said it was like a King's throne and it really was. It's just, it's on this perfect bench in an opening, like right on a ridge, like overlooking multiple drainages. And it's just, I mean, it was so picturesque and perfect. And he's just laying in his bed and he's bugling. And you would ask me, you know, after the fact, like, you know, how big was he? And I mean, I'm not, I didn't, I intentionally didn't want to give you a number because any number I said wasn't going to be right. And I didn't want to put a, a, an incorrect number in your head of what this guy was. But I, all I knew was it was a giant six. And uh, and like you alluded to, you know, you got to put eyes on him um, a couple of days later and, and you realized like, you know, how big he really was. And um, But when I saw him, I just knew like the wind was blowing right to left as I'm looking at him. Um, and I was able to drop off that left side of that military crest, you know, so he couldn't see me <clears throat> and I had the perfect wind in my favor. And, uh, and I guess there's, there's two lessons that I learned from this one. Um, you know, we talked about it a lot. Um, you know, I, I got to within bow range easily and, and the way that he was kind of positioned, you know, I was able to stay below his eyesight and, and below that crest of that hill and I could see the tips of his antlers. Um, and, you know, I, I, I ranged, uh, couldn't really range him, but I could range the tree behind him. The tree behind him was at 40. Um, there's a tree in front of him that was at, like, I think 11. Um, and so, you know, eventually by the time he did stand up, I, you know, he was about 14, 15 yards away. Um, and, and so the mistake that I made, you know, and again, we talked about this, was just, you know, getting too close. Like I, he never winded me or, or saw me, but you know, they just have that instinct of like something's in my bubble. Right. And, um, you know, had I stayed at, you know, 30 or 40 yards away from him and just waited on him to stand up, um, I would have had a shot when he stood up. Um, it, at least, you know, in theory, because when he did stand up, the way that he stood up was, um, you know, he stood up with his butt directly to me and then just walked straight in that direction and never presented a shot. Um, and you know, you're thinking like, okay, well, if I had stayed back, maybe he would have gotten up and I would have had a broadside shot, um, or, or at least him present a shot opportunity. But, um, and I think the other thing was, you know, I didn't trust my range finder. Um, and this was something that we had talked about too, after the fact was, you know, sometimes when you're out there, um, you know, you shoot those distances and, you know, it looks further than what the rangefinder is telling you, or it looks closer than what it's telling you. And, you know, I've shot enough, you know, at 3D courses and, and enough at angles to where I should have just trusted it and then stayed back and just waited on him. But, you know, trusting your rangefinder, not stalking the failure, um, learn those the hard way on that big bull. Yeah, it's um, hunting these bulls, they'll humble you, you know, it's like sometimes they're just going to win too. And in hindsight, it's twenty twenty. You just never know. You could have made those moves and held up, you know, further and, and same thing could have happened. But yeah, you try to, you try to analyze and dissect these stocks so we can improve and get better, you know, so the next time we get that opportunity, you know, we send an arrow through that bull. But, you know, I, I don't think you made any giant mistakes. You kept the wind right. You had a good approach and, and you don't really know what what you have until you get there and so like like uh you know if that ridge would have laid out a little bit different the way that ridge laid out you had to get so close to be able to see that elk to see over the rise so that was good because it hit a lot of your movement there but it was bad because then you had to get so close and inside his bubble you know where he could almost hear you moving through the grass or could any movement inside that bubble or even just that sixth sense that you're talking about a of being too close like that's how close you had to get to get a shot from that position now you know in hindsight if you would have known that spot or been there before or know how it laid out yeah you might have tried to circle up higher and tried to shoot down on them or hold up at those yardages and and let them stand up and let it happen so they're good lessons learned but you you, you never know if that 
uh, that hindsight's you know correct or not. Like I had, um, I just got done with this this muley buck hunt that was just incredible. And late season, deep snow, big mountains, and one of the biggest mistakes I made was um, I was days into it and had all these close calls and. You just couldn't get away with much. These does would would catch her, you know. They just catch movement, and I kept getting better throughout the hunt and uh, more patient and um, uh, 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 better with my moves. And and um, so I caught this buck, and it was rutting the stow. And we came over, and it's in this snowy meadow, and I can see him at at 50 yards and he's walking away from me rutting this doe and I'm trying to get a range and there's no shot and he kind of disappears over the fold and so I keep creeping over knowing that he's right there and playing the game trying to look for a shot and I can kind of catch sight of him and all of a sudden the doe comes and she's coming back at us so I, I motion for my cameraman to sit down or crouch down and I crouch down so now we're crouched in the sage so we're hidden we don't have that stand up human profile also when we crouched like they didn't see us crouch because we had that rise and so our movement was hidden like I see a lot of guys make that mistake that as soon as they see an elk or a deer they crouch and then that movement alerts that animal to their presence and we didn't do that here we had crouched so now we're hidden in the sage and now this doe is is bringing this buck right by me, right down below me, broadside, 40 yards. Here they come, and that buck's just rutting that doe, and they come right by me. And at 40 yards, he's broadside, and I try to draw on him. And I try to draw, and I'm just in their peripheral vision, you know, that doe's vision, yeah. and I'm so close and in their bubble that when I went to go make that move, and now I, I should – um. Uh, I should tell you that like as they're coming at me and as that doe's coming at me, she gave us a couple glances of like something's weird, but she never stopped in her tracks and stared at us. She never knew we were danger. Just like that's a little funky in a in a in a white meadow, you know, to see this crouched dark figure or whatever. So she gave us a couple yeah. looks and was a little fishy, but she kept bringing that buck right by us. But the moment I went to draw that movement. It was too much. She exploded out of there. She took that buck. They they never they never stopped. They never gave me a shot. I was so frustrated. It was like five days into it, uh, probably seven stocks into the hunt or something, or seven plays oh, into man. the hunt. And um, you know, here was my moment in the perfect play, and I messed it up. You know, and it brought me back to like hunting Hawaii and these axis deer. You never try to draw on an axis buck if he's looking at you. They just won't put up with movement. And so, like, it's like not even an option because the moment you go to draw they're gone so you have to actually wait even if an axis buck sees you and stare is staring at you you have to wait till they turn away and walk away from you and then try to get drawn and shoot them it's like the only thing you can do and and i should have used like that knowledge that i gained about movement and drawing my bow i mean heck in colorado it took me 40 minutes to try to draw and shoot this buck because there was so many heads around looking in different directions and i didn't want to get caught so i know better but yep. during these mule deer and during the rut i'd been playing so aggressively uh you know trying to cut them off and move here and use ridge lines and and not hunting recklessly, but definitely hunting aggressively. And I just thought that was my chance. And when I drew and he took off and, you know, in hindsight, I think like I should have waited and let him just work by me and then got a range. Even if it was a further shot, I could have drawn my bow and have him not know I was there. So it's like playing that hindsight game, you know, where I I really think I made a mistake in that stock and I could have done better and waited for him to pass. But who knows what would have happened? They could have passed in the way these deer are moving. That doe could have just kept charging and, and never stopped. And I, w I would have thought, gosh, I should have tried to draw it 40 yards when they were broadside right there, you know? And so, like, <laughs> yep. like um, sometimes or they're just... Or take a 90 degree turn and just move exactly away from you. Yeah, totally. Yeah, anything can happen, you know, but you do try to learn from it and try to get better. And I, you know, I noticed throughout the hunt, I was getting better and more patient and, um, uh, definitely more precise with my stocks and using topography better because it was just like anything in the open, they just catch you, you know, whether even if you stick a tree in front of you and them, like they just catch mm -hmm. that movement between the branches. So really getting down and, and, you know, doing crawling or using the topography or just being patient and letting them move to the right spot and eventually it paid off. But, um, yeah, man, that using that hindsight on those stocks, I do think is important, but you you had a close call on that bull and tried to play it as good as you could play it, but you had heard some other elk 
bugling. And like we say, the key to killing elk is being into elk. So you realize like the few cows that I saw, now you got on this giant bull, you ran out of light, but you could hear them bugling up above. And so we went back in there the next morning and it's kind of a wild spot that, you know, you can glass just a couple meadows from afar. But once you get in there, we kind of ended up like still hunting a lot of those ridge lines in there just because you couldn't glass it. But there was sure a lot of elk in there. Oh, there really were. And, and you're right. It's, it's such a unique area. Um, I mean, you can see why it holds so many elk. I mean, like you said, it's just there's so many connecting ridge lines. You know, there's there's all kinds of cover and, and feed. Um, there weren't a lot of um, open areas. There weren't a lot of places where we could glass far off. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that first day when I was up there alone, I heard several bugles and, you know, that was enough for us to say, hey, we're going to go back in there the next day. And, and you know, like you said, we spent the entire day there that Friday. And I mean, we bumped into several different uh, groups, um, but it was just, it was so thick and so um, you, you couldn't see more than like bow range ahead of you and so every time we would like see them like they're already we're already on top of them and you know at that point it was like a little bit too late and um you know we were able to to spot that group bedded uh, in the afternoon and we did kind of get a stalk there but you know they were the way they were positioned was you know kind of out on this finger um and, you know, on all three sides, it just drops off. So there was only one way that we could approach. And, you know, fortunately, the wind was in our face. And, um, you know, we could at least try that. And, you know, there were there were more elk out there than, than we thought. And, and like you said, with the deer, I mean, there's just so many eyes. Um, you know, you think you're stalking one, but then there's a whole bunch over here that have eyes on you. And, um, you know, every time you come around another tree, like there's another elk that you didn't know was there and it already spotted you. And, um, you know, I, I think just one other thing on that first bull that, um, that first day, I thought a lot about it. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I would love to have, have been able to be successful on that one, but had I been successful on that bull, um, we wouldn't have had the, the hunts and the stalks that we had, uh, you know, Friday and Saturday and Sunday, um, because, you know, I would have been tagged out and we would have just been looking for, you know, that huge bull for you. Right. And, you know, we wouldn't have gotten to go on, you know, all those other, um, stalks and, and get that experience. And so, um, in a way I'm, I'm kind of grateful that it, it worked out the way that it did because, um, you know, like we were talking about at the top, I mean, it's just, it, it's such great learning experience and, and, um, you know, getting those at bats, if you will. Um, but yeah, we got, we got that one, um, on that Friday. Um, you know, we got, I think we were, what were we like 60 or 70 yards away from those, um, you know, and just couldn't quite get us, uh, you know, like a shooting lane. Um, and then they kind of hurt us or winded us or something and, and just kind of bolted. But, you know, that was, um, I think, to get from where we were to as close as we were, we were happy with that one. Um, didn't really pinpoint anything that we did wrong. Um, and then the next day, you know, we, we went on the other side, um, uh, other side of the valley, and, and we had two different stalks that day. Um, you know, one was in the snow first thing in the morning, and um, because of the snow, we weren't able to see what was underneath of it, and uh, it turned out it was like a shale face. <laughs> And trying to be quiet on a shale face covered in snow uh, doesn't really work. We learned that one the hard way. Um, and then uh, on the way out, we spotted that other bull bedded um, under a tree across a creek. And so again, we're you know we're crossing a creek to get over there. And um, you know that one we had to take our eyes off of and kind of lose visual to you know start that stalk. And then when we got over there, by the time we got to where we thought he was going to be, we, we couldn't you know, he had gotten up and left and we actually, we could see his bed. And, um, I think, you know, either, either he left by the time we started the stalk or maybe he busted us. We're not sure, but, um, you know, that was one where we saw him from the road and, you know, we're able to close a little bit of the distance on the, in the vehicle and then start the stalk. Um, so we're not sure at what point he got up and left, but, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, we were, like you said, we're, we're using the, the vehicles to, to cover ground and, and using the glass to, 
you know, find the elk and then make a play and, and go all in. And I think that was a really interesting, um, I guess, lesson for me. I had never really done it that way. And you know, I think that was something that we talked about that it almost seems like you're taking the easy way or the lazy way out, but you're really not. You're, you're being more efficient and that allows you to be more effective and, and make the best use of your time. And, um, you know, if you're in an area where you can do that, um, you know, why not take advantage of, of everything that's at your disposal? And, you know, it's not like we were being lazy and, you know, there wasn't a day where we didn't get thousands of feet of elevation gain and loss and, you know, um, almost double digit miles every single day. And so, um, yeah, um, I mean, we, we had a blast and we? we had tons of opportunities and, you know, and then the big storm came on Monday and changed everything. Oh, it's so fun. Um, I just have to say, I just love your perspective on things, Ryan, like, um, your perspective on that, that bowl, like there's not many guys that would, you know, uh, uh, have a failed stalker, not kill that bull and go, Hey, it was a blessing. You know, it was a blessing. I didn't kill that bull on the first day because I got so much more experience stalking these other elk. Like, like that's the attitude of a winner. That's the, like the overall goal is to improve your hunting skill set. and trophies are going to fall. Bulls are going to fall to your arrow just because you're learning so much. You went on three different hunts this season. You've been all in on every single hunt and, and uh, to get this, this stalking experience and to look at it with that kind of perspective i just think is so great and it's like taking a page out of your own book and but like your book is one of my favorite books on mental toughness dude the the research that you put into that book and the the description of how to gain mental toughness and how to gain that edge i really think it's one of the best resources out there at uh, uh, F your feelings uh, is the, uh, for short, but it's just a great book that you that you wrote and you live by it, dude. You you live by it, and now you're using all this in your elk hunting to improve your hunting skill set. And dude, there's not a doubt in my mind that you're gonna arrow a bunch of good bulls in your career just because of that. But I just think that perspective that you have is a beautiful thing. Like to take that failure, to learn from it, and go, yeah, man, that was a blessing. Like from there, you know, I got five days of the most epic elk action and got more stocks and more plays. And, and like you say, we, we put ourselves in bow range a bunch and, and just a bunch of chances and moving around elk, like getting comfortable with moving on elk and using the topography, trying to hide us, trying to make calculated plays and, and put ourselves in range. And sure it isn't easy, but, um, I, I just, um, I, I love that attitude and approach you had. So yeah, you you describe some of those stocks, man. That last one we had where we crossed the creek. I remember crossing the creek and we crossed <laughs> a log on that thing. And so, uh, like I'm 160 pounds wet and wearing boots, and uh, I crossed on this log that you really had to balance on, you know, and cross this creek. And then you know I look back at you and I think I even filmed it, you know, and you were a little nervous yeah, holding did. on to the sticks crossing it, and you got about halfway and like you've got a bigger frame than I do. And I remember that log settled like an inch really quick, like you were going down. <laughs> then your eyes got about as big as saucers, but you you made the crossing. But we we made a really good approach on this bull. Like um, he was in the perfect place, bedded by himself. We we had a great approach. The problem was is the winds were really swirly getting over there, and so we were trying yeah. to just decide. Do we come up on the left side of them? Do we come up on the right side of them? And we made a, a a group decision to come up on the right because of the winds. And I I actually thought like towards the end of that stock, I thought we had our winds pretty well dialed when we came over the ridge. And we actually waited to come over the ridge to get the right winds. And our approach would have been perfect. It would have put us right in range, undetected from that bull. You would have arrowed him right in his bed, but um. As elk hunting goes, um, he wasn't in that bed when we got there. You know, he had he had either walked off like you stated, or like climbing up that hill. Some of our scent had drifted around enough to to clue him in that we were playing the game with him or stalking him. So um, it's just how it goes when you're elk hunting, and you know, just like this latest mule deer hunt. When I talk about those stalks and those plays, it takes a lot of those chances to have it come together, and that was the case, you know, for you on this hunt. Is is um, you know, we saw a lot of elk and 
got on a lot of elk. It was just tough to make it happen. And so you talked about like our approach and our approach on this one, you know, the elk are starting to get pushed down off the, the mountains uh, and start to get on the faces. And so um, you're right. We used our vehicle and a vehicle like it's um, it can be a real asset to you because um, if you're only on foot. Uh, which which is um, like one of the purest ways to hunt is to backpack into a place and live in there. And I love hunting that way. But as we get into this season, it, it's not as effective because these elk are getting out on these faces. And so what we were doing is we were grabbing different vantage points. And, you know, like I've lived in this, this valley for 20 years. So I know a lot of these places that show off that country where these elk show up and we would glass and, and we'd. Um, like glassing is not only the, um, it, it's not only like how you glass country, like it's almost a mindset. It's almost like believing in your glass and believing in these vantage points and then being there at the right times. And so, um, you, you can only be at one spot at, at first light or, you know, you have to pick and choose your spots, but a vehicle does allow you to be mobile where you can use that first hour of light and grab a couple different great vantage points to look over country find the elk and then you know then you're hiking with a purpose into those elk you're not hiking to look for them and so that's that's the tactics we were using this time of year is to find those elk and hiking into them and like you say you know at times it's like gosh i you know you, you almost feel like you are taking the easy way out or the lazy but it's it's the smart approach you know to find those elk and then hunt those elk and like you said like every day we were doing thousands of feet of elevation and close to double digit miles if not over double digit miles like we hunted them hard but but we hunted them uh smart by locating them first and then putting ourselves in those elk and i think you know that was a big difference maker for us yeah, it really was. And I mean, it goes, you know, it's kind of like C point number one, right? You have to be an elk to kill elk. And um, I mean, I think you, you said it well just a second ago that, you know, we're not hiking in like blindly, right? We're, we're hiking in with a purpose because we've seen elk there. And, um, you know, that, that helps on the mental side as well, right? Because you know that they're there and, and, you know, hiking and thinking that they're there or believing that they're there is one thing, but actually seeing them and going after them is, is a whole other, um, you know, ball game. Um, and, you know, when you're talking day after day, um, you know, every little bit like that helps and you, know, you want to stack those odds in your favor. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and in a lot of times too, you know, like there's there's plays that can be made where you uh you know, you 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 park your vehicle at different access points and you hike short distances to vantage points and then look over remote backcountry back there, but there's no guarantee like uh that time of year I'm not going to load up with you know, five days worth of stuff or seven days worth of stuff and go into a drainage where I don't know there's elk. Like I'd rather, I'd rather go light and I'd rather pack in and go grab a good vantage point and look over a drainage and find them and, and then, you know, hunt them when they're there. Yeah. It just, it just made more sense. And, you know, every time we'd get to a good vantage point in that mountain and pick country apart, like you're kind of ruling out country too. Like if you don't see elk in there, the tracks in there, you know, they're not yep. there, but when you do see elk or you see a bull, well, then you can start to formulate a plan and go, okay, maybe we can't make it to him today, but now we know where some elk are. So tomorrow we're going to hike up this drainage and we're going to hunt this ridge line and we're going to go look for those things in there. You just, you know, elk are in there, you know, and even like that, that spot we hunted for the first couple days where you about killed that good bull. Like, I just saw a handful of cows in there. We weren't sure how many elk were in there. There ended up being, you know, over 100 elk probably on those ridge lines and multiple different bulls in there. I, I just caught a glimpse of a few, and then we made the effort and got up in there and had pretty good hunt in there for those couple days. We about killed one, but even mm -hmm. though you couldn't glass in that country, it seemed like every time we'd get to an opening, we would spot elk. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, the sign was, was crazy. I mean, do you remember, um, all the rut activity that, that we could see and your know, rubs and, and everything that were up there? Um, I mean, it, it, you could just tell that they had been up there and, and were still there. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was really cool to be able to find that spot. I think one of the other things that, that enabled us to, um, to kind of play the strategy or, or utilize the strategy that you just described was, uh, was the timing as well. Right. And, 
you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't know if we want to tell everybody the secret, <laughs> but anybody that paid attention to your solo recap and knows, you know, when you killed your uh, bull, I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, the, the week that everybody circles in September. Right. And, and because of that, you know, we were able to, I mean, there, there was one face that I can think of where there were multiple rigs in the parking lot, but everywhere else that we went, we basically had it to ourselves. And we were, we were basically the only people in the Valley that week. It was awesome. Wasn't it? The the pressure <laughs> was off. Yeah. Some of this yeah. off season hunting, like um, you're right. That is a big component to why we were into a lot of elk, you know, and like, um, you know, whether you're hunting it early in pre rut and, and hunting them like a lot of times early, all those elk are in the mountains. Like none of those elk have come down to private. And so they're all in the mountains in condensed numbers. And then, you know, also during the rut can be a great time to hunt them because there's a lot of action. You do deal with more pressure. And then as it gets later, yeah, the, um, uh, the, the, the pressure wanes and um you know the elk are still there in the mountains and um there's still and some, they some were still good hunting. yeah yeah they were the only the big groups though like you heard the bugles on those elk that that first day and when we went back into that spot we got into elk and still hunted and saw some but we didn't hear a bugle that next day that's right we didn't and it did kind of shut down um so that next day that was the friday right and and so there really weren't many bugles Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but we saw elk and we were in some groups, but they were like medium sized groups. They weren't the really big ones. And then after the snow, that's when they got back into the like huge groups. And that Tuesday when we saw them on private, they were bugling and rutting. And then, you know, Wednesday back at it again, but that time they were actually on public. Yeah. And that's when, that's when you got your monster. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, what a great bull, dude. That was so fun to share that hunt with you and, and arrow that bull. Oh I so gosh. wanted you to, to kill a bull on that hunt, but, um, man, we had a lot of fun that week, and um, uh, that that was just the uh, the icing on the cake to be able to kill a bull like that and in my home valley. Um, dude, I was so stoked. I'm still stoked. I, I, you should be, and, and I was so happy for you. And I mean, yeah, it would have been really cool to, to double on that day, but, I mean, I just felt like like – from a karmic standpoint, like you deserve it, like all the, everything you do for, for everybody else. And, you know, with the podcast and, you know, I know how much you help people at, at, you know, events all year long. And I mean, I can just, I can attest to what you, you know, did and, and helped me with, you know, just in that week that I was out there. And, you know, when I came out, I was expecting just maybe to, to hunt team up a couple of days and ended up, you know, being every single day. And, you know, um, man, just, I wanted you to get one almost more than I wanted one for me, just as a, as a, like, you know, to make it worth it, not to make it worth your while, but like, you know, I just, I, I would have felt terrible if, if you were helping me and didn't get one. So I'm glad you did. Dude, you're selfless. Like, um, gosh, I mean, um, you were pulling for my success the whole time and you, you stated multiple times on there. You see the bull you want, it's all yours. You're going for it, you know. And it, it's um, you want a hunting partner that wants your success as much as uh, as their own success. That's what makes a really good hunting partner. And it it almost has to be that way, you know. And so yeah, I mean, like when we team up together, you know, I really want you to kill an elk and kill a bull, and we're gonna work really hard to try to kill you one. And vice versa, you were working really hard to help me try to kill one and help me try to find, you know, this this target bowl that I'm looking for a great big six point, you know, and so like like it just worked like you're a really good hunting partner and you're really selfless. And so, um, yeah, man, you were super stoked for me. You helped me pack out that bowl. Um, uh, really happy, and we just shared this like great week of hunting. But you know, that's just the start. We're gonna we're gonna share a bunch more of these things and <laughs> and uh, kill some bulls together, you know. But um, that's what that's what makes a good hunting partner is um uh, uh sharing everything too, you know, like um. You know, when you find oh, elk is going to get your buddy to bring him in there. And, and, and then, yeah. you know, stuff happens. Sometimes you're maybe you're calling for your buddy and, and the bull comes into the collar and he ends up shooting, shooting him. But you you have to 
you, you, you want your friends to be as ex- as successful as you are. You you want them to have their chances and have their opportunities, and that's what makes for a, a really good team in the mountains, I think. And and having two people, boy, you're able to keep like such a a good mental state and good mental attitude, and able to to bounce ideas off each other. And so you've got you've got two heads thinking about these scenarios and where these elk are and where you should go the next day. And the the military has a saying um, or like a team snipers. Um, uh, you know, two is one, one is none. That um, you mm-hmm. know, that that yeah. two people together makes one, and one person alone makes none. And and as much as I love hunting solo, I just love sharing hunts with good friends like that. And um, you know, sometimes I'm going to get a chance to arrow a bull, and sometimes you're going to get an arrow, get a chance to arrow a bull. And um, you know, like uh, we're going to make each other better and find more elk because you know we're hunting together and um, theorizing together, and and at times splitting up and grabbing two vantage points, which is going to double the intel that you that you gain in an area. You know, so um, man, it just worked. We had a blast. You know, having uh, that extra person also helps dig a truck out of a snowdrift, too. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, it sure does. We buried that truck. Oh, my gosh. That well, was pretty gnarly. We got, I don't know, it was like maybe five or ten minutes after we we you know, were dug out and driving. You're like, man, we should have gotten a picture of that. Uh, or you said, I should have gotten a picture so I could randomly text it to you and say, you remember that time that we did this? <laughs> and I, I've, I've thought about that so many times since then. Like, I was like, man, I wish I had that picture to just send Brian and be like, do you remember that time we <laughs> almost got the truck stuck? <laughs> oh, but man. It, it's a good opportunity to just you know that reminder of like if you are in the truck like have the truck prepared and we were we were lucky that you had you know your normal shovel in there yeah i did not have my show my snow shovel in there but i did have a regular shovel and i did have the chains and uh did have straps and so we were we were pretty set to go but we buried that truck man we were we were driving and we went went around this this um this corner that was drifted in we drove the whole road and it had snowed a bunch like a foot foot and a half in the valley and um we drove around this corner and and, um went around this corner and all of a sudden it just went white there was just you couldn't see anything and we were stuck and uh, we were stuck in this snow drift and so we kind of backed up and went forward and got out maybe dug a little bit and worked at it and finally loosed out the truck but it didn't go back from where we came it went through the snow drift it's just the way our momentum and the way we were stuck so now we're on the other side of the snow drift and so you know we look at it and we're like man we'll probably get stuck if we try to go back through it let's just go to the highway this side you know on on this road and so we started down it and um the drift started getting deeper and deeper and pretty soon you know we're rallying the truck and uh, uh counter steering back and forth and and trying to keep our momentum through this snow drift and four wheel drive and and uh, we're rallying through it and um pretty soon we can see like this this distant object kind of in the road i'm like man is that a cattle guard or like a like a fence gate or what is that thing and as we get closer and we're screaming 20 30 miles an hour sideways through this snow drift and as we get closer we realize it's this truck that's buried above the hood in snow you know and it was and a we, big truck too. oh my god like it, it wasn't like a little tacoma <laughs> it was like a, an f-350 or something Oh my gosh. And so he's buried and we rally by him and uh, try not to hit that truck and keep our momentum. And we didn't make it too much further and we were buried and probably like a, probably a half a mile from the highway where we had to get out. And um, so, yeah, it was um, bitter cold, man. That wind was blowing and um, I'm sure the wind chill had it below zero and blowing snow. And um, so, yeah, we, um, we got out. We had to work at that one, man. Digging those tires out. We'd get a little momentum, and we'd make it five feet, and then we'd stuck again. And finally, we um we get we got it chained up, and those um those chains really help with grabbing momentum. And um finally um after I mean we must have worked an hour or two at that thing, digging on it and taking turns and cold hands and the whole deal. But um finally got the momentum and kicked out of there. So always an adventure. And you're right, like um. 
it is a good reason to have like a good hunting partner. Like you get in those bad situations and you're just able to figure it out and you got two heads in there and you got two hands to help with the work. And that goes for stuck in a snow drift that goes for hunting in grizzly bear country that goes for, you know, like nasty weather in the back country that can come in on you and storms. And, um, you know, you, you've got a, like the, the first three rules of back country hunting are safety, safety, and safety. Like you got to live to hunt another day, you know, and so like having another cool head around you to figure out those situations and, and keep safe, um, sure is advantageous. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, and I mean, just to piggyback on what you said earlier, I mean, you know, I think, um, it, it means a lot to me to, to hear you say, you know, what you say about the book and, um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that I've always enjoyed listening to your podcast and even before we met and kind of became friends that, you know, I, you know, I can tell that we have very similar mindsets and, and it's really a blast to be able to, you know, hunt with somebody that, that shares that, that mindset. And, um, you know, when, when both of you bring that type of a mindset to a shared passion, whether it's hunting or, you know, it could be anything, um, it just, it, it does make for, you know, um, just a, a really special environment. So, um, I think, uh, you know, I would, I would also have to say that you are a really great hunting partner as well. And, uh, I'm just grateful for the experience and opportunity to get to do that together. Ah, oh, thanks brother. That's really nice of you to say. Yep. Um, man, it was an absolute blast. We, um, we have to share another one and, um, got to get you that bowl on the deck. Like it's coming. Um, you've been paying oh, yeah. your dues and building this skill set and, and training for out West. And, um, you had that good elk hunt before you came out here too, where, um, you were putting in yep. practice all the e-scouting, like you were, uh, you took, uh, Mark Livesay's course, um, on e-scouting yep. and, um, you dove head first, like, um, uh, you're definitely like trying to build all the right skill sets to be consistently successful. And so you went and east out of this place and, and, um, you know, it's tough hunting you like, it sounds like the challenges there with some of the terrain and things like big Aspen forest, but, uh, you guys found some elk and man, you had a close call down there. Oh man, we did. And, you know, I, I actually sent Mark a message recently and, and just let him know how much I appreciate, you know, everything he does in, in building that course. And you know, I think, I'm a lot like him in, in the sense of, you know, if, if I'm going to go from, I know he was in Missouri, but, you know, from Virginia or Missouri to go out West, like I want to do all that studying or as much of that as I can before I get out there. And, you know, I can't go scout it boots on the ground. So I'm going to do everything I can to try to, um, again, it's just, it's about being efficient and optimizing my time. Right. I only have a couple of days out there. Um, you know, I was out there for nine, but still, you know, it's, I want to make the most of that. And, um, yeah, that particular unit was, was really tough. Um, I remember telling you that, um, I mean, it, it, there were just, there were almost no opportunities to glass. It was basically the opposite of what you and I, um, did. I mean, it was just, you know, you, you do some e-scouting, you pick some places that, that you think are going to hold elk and then you just you're on foot and you're just covering country, um, you know, just big, thick Aspen and, um, you know, pine forests and, um, we uh, we heard some bugles. We had some opportunities. Um, I, I had a, a really good friend of mine, Zach, was was out there with me, and um, I mean, just he's just another amazing hunting partner. I mean, he didn't even have an elk tag. Um, he's you know uh, takes five or six days of leave to to come you know call for me and, and help me on this hunt, and um, uh, we got uh, we had an amazing opportunity on a really big bull and. I don't know if it was, I'll just say it was in the same class as the one that, uh, that I had an opportunity on in, in Montana that you saw. It was, it was very close to that size. Um, it was definitely a herd bull. It didn't have cows yet. And, uh, and it was screaming its head off and it was so close to the trailhead that when it was bugling, I mean, this was like, before the sun came up, you know, we were going to be starting our hike, you know, in the dark. And, and this thing is just ripping, um, the, where the trailhead was, it went straight off a cliff and then it goes straight up the other side. And, um, he was just on the other side of us. Um, um, there was a Creek down in the bottom and, um, Zach and I just looked at each other. It was so close to the trailhead. We're like, that has to be other hunters. There's no way that's a bull. And he's like, well, 
only one way to find out. And if we ignore it, we'll kill ourselves, you know, or, or you know, we won't be able to live with ourselves if, if it turns out to be a real one. So let's just go down here and we'll find out. And we were going to hike that way anyway. So he bugles back and, and this thing bugles back and, you know, we go down and um, it's, you know, we're, we're kind of, the, the trail goes around this, like, um, uh, like, a, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the, the switchbacks. And so you come down you know, one way on the switchback and you come back. And then as it's coming around the corner, uh, it comes through the bottom of the creek. And, uh, and right as we come around this corner, Zach's a couple of steps ahead of me and he just, he does the, like the shop, the stop short and like right where he is, he puts his arms out and he's like, Oh my God, there's a bull right there. He's like, get in front of me. And this thing was 60 yards away at that point. And it was just screaming its head off. And we ended up going back and forth with this thing for almost two hours. Um, it was just really cool to be able to see it, um, to see a, a bull of that caliber at that distance and, and to be interacting with it. So Zach was there calling for me and, um, you know, he had this thing fired up and, um, I got, um, you know, he, he kind of, the bull went behind some trees and I was able to work up a little bit closer and he was kind of moving a little bit to the left. And so Zach, you know, we, we kind of get into this setup where he's behind me and, and Zach can see me, but because of the bull being a little bit uphill, he couldn't see the bull. And, uh, and the bull was behind some like young aspens, like some brushy stuff. And, and I could see that he was breaking the tree and I can see him moving his head. And, and if he would move to his right a few steps, he would just give me a perfect shot at like 44 yards. And, um, he actually, he starts doing it. He starts walking that way. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is going to happen. He's, he's going to walk into that opening and he's going to give me a shot. And like, he, we've talked about like, I, you know, I grew up and still hunt whitetail all the time. And it's that feeling of like, you, you know, you're in the tree stand and you know, you know where your window is and that thing's going to walk right into it. And you're like, man, this is going to happen. It's like exactly the way I envisioned it. And that bull just starts going and he, he crosses behind some brush. And when his head is behind the brush, I draw. Now, because of the way we were set up, like I told you, Zach could see me, but he couldn't see the elk. And so this is a lesson, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up this um, encounter with the bull, because I think this is a, a lesson worth sharing. And I, I do not, I, I'm not throwing Zach under the bus. I don't want to do that. And, and I know that he was just trying to help and he was doing everything he could to, to try to help. But um, when he saw me draw, he threw out a cow call. And the second that he did it, that bull stopped on a dime. And what ended up happening was he, I was drawing when he couldn't see me. So he's behind this brush. And so because the bull stopped on a dime right there, he was two steps short of being in my window for the shot. And, you know, I end up holding at full draw for like two and a half minutes. And Zach's filming this thing. And, uh, and then, you know, he's, Zach is directly behind me. So this bull is staring through me to where he heard the noise. Um, you know, these things, you know, they're so good. They know exactly where that sound came from. And he's got drool and slobber coming off of his mouth. And I mean, it was just, it was so cool to see it, but man, I, I wish I would have had a shot opportunity and could have put that one on the ground, but you know, he stood there and, and stared for about two, two and a half minutes. And then he just kind of did that thing where he, he you know, he drops his head and, and he kind of wheels and turns around to the left and just kind of peeled away from me. <clears throat> just never gave me a shot opportunity. Um, and then actually, I mean, we were lucky. We got to continue to kind of interact with him and he was still calling and raking and, you know, still another like 30 minutes of back and forth with him, just couldn't get another shot opportunity. But um, I think the, the lesson there is, you know, communicate ahead of time before the encounters with, you know, if you have a caller, um, don't let that same thing happen to you. Communicate ahead of time that, Hey, look, the shooter stops the animal. Um, you know, because even if, even if you have line of sight from the caller to the animal, you may not be able to see like the exact trajectory of where the arrow is going to be you know, going. And so maybe there's brush that you can't see or, or you think that there's an opening, but, but the shooter, you know, realizes that the arrow, or doesn't have that you know clean path so shooter stops the animal learn that one the hard way this year too gosh i like that rule god what 
what an exciting uh, encounter with that bull to be able to play the game like that for a couple hours and try to get a shot like that's uh it's what dreams are made of like if it if the deal just could have been closed but man um you are paying your elk dues like you are you are gaining that necessary experience you are getting those close calls and learning all these lessons man it's, it, it's gonna pay off like um you are an well, elk hunter now like you've had all these experiences <laughs> now with a rifle and with a bow and close encounters yeah. and and you can see it's not just one magical encounter like that is one magical encounter for sure like and one that'll be ingrained and burned into your memory for a lifetime but you know you had a whole season of those close calls and close encounters and and being into range and it it is it's just getting those chances and and you know further in that skill set and eventually it just comes together and you he steps out and takes that step and you you stop him or he stops and you put that perfect arrow in that bowl man it's coming for you I, i'm feeling it 2022 but um it's so great to get your perspective on the podcast like coming from virginia um new to elk hunting like three years in now um but man you have just been all in so uh it's coming man just keep putting in the work Oh man, I, I know it is, and and just I have to to give you some kudos too. I mean, you, you knew that story uh, before you and I hunted together. Um, you know, for the week that I came out in Montana, and I actually um, I've been home for a couple of days, and I shot you a text and was like, "Hey, um, had a tough punt, and uh, you know, would love to you know chat through it. Are you available?" And you're like, "Man, uh, I'll be home in a couple hours. Like, give me a call tonight." And, you know, you got on the phone with me and, and, and talked to me and you, you listened to me and, um, you know, like, man, you, you told me everything I needed to hear. And, and I mean, I know, like, I mean, we talked about mindset, like I know all the things, right. And just to just hear you say like, Hey, I've done that more times than, than you would imagine. Like it's happening, like it's opportunities or, um, you know, experiences like that. I've, you know, I've been through them all. And, um, you know, to just hear that, that somebody like you has to deal with that as well. And then, and then, you know, I'll never forget what you said. You said, um, get your mind right, get your butt to Montana and arrow a bull. And, you know, for a guy that writes a book after his feelings, like that's what I needed to hear. And, um, I mean, I just, I can't thank you enough for being the person you are and the friend that you are. Um, so thank you, Brian. Oh, dude, likewise, right back at you. Um, thanks for doing this podcast twice. <laughs> like, uh, you're, you're a really good friend. So, man, I appreciate it. Uh, we'll definitely be keeping in touch um, through the, the application season. And, um, yeah, I just appreciate you, man. Dude, uh, right back at you. I'm grateful for you, and uh, thank you for everything you do for all the hunters and, and bow hunters out there. Yep, we'll talk soon. All right. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Oh, thanks again to Ryan for coming on. Uh, make sure to check out everything they're doing over at Fuel the Pursuit. Uh, they've got an online course you can check out. Uh, it's got a great section on mental toughness. Uh, went through the course myself and really enjoyed it. And, um, yeah, they've got the Fuel the Pursuit, their backcountry meals. Uh, they're going to be super healthy, uh, good tasting, and, and great for backcountry hunters. And uh, super proud of those guys for putting that together. I know they've worked really hard at it. And uh, also check out uh, Ryan's book, uh, F Your Feelings. Uh, it's just this great book. I really enjoyed the read on it. And uh, I've recommended it to a bunch of my friends in, in my circle. And I know those guys have really enjoyed it too. So uh, if you're in the market for a good read, go check that out. And uh, thanks again to Ryan for coming on the podcast. Uh, again, some unconventional tactics for hunting elk. Uh, late season, uh, deep snow, um, man, post rut. But, uh, you know, we just uh, kept after it, and uh, gosh, I was able to arrow this great bull in the late season with just a handful of days left in to, uh, left to hunt with my bow. So um, I was super stoked and super stoked to share the hunt with Ryan, and we just had a great time going hard. So uh, thanks to that guy. Uh, just really enjoy uh, uh, hanging out with him and hunting with him and, and uh, also having him on the podcast. So... Uh, I want to thank our sponsor for today's show, Six Hour Optics. Uh, again, make sure to check out their range finders, uh, their binos, scopes, uh, image stabilization binos. Those things are wild. And uh, everything they're doing over there. They're doing great work and super impressed. 
I also want to thank Eastman's for their support of the podcast. Uh, make sure to check out the magazines, the TV show, and uh, also uh, Eastman's Tag Hub, the internet research tool. And uh, thanks to those guys for everything they do for the podcast and supporting me. Uh, really looking forward to 2022, bringing you guys some great recordings and um, keeping this podcast thing rolling. So uh, really appreciate the support for you guys. Uh, the uh, the shares on social media, uh, the reviews on uh, iTunes and things of that nature really help you know get the podcast out there and, and uh, help us grow it. So uh, appreciate you guys for all the support and um, yeah, keep working hard towards your goals. 2022 is coming. And, uh, you know, now's the time to improve our skill sets. Um, super stoked on, um, like, I just didn't, I love the entire process of preparing for these hunts, training for these hunts, putting my everything into them to give myself a chance at success. And, uh, this season is no different, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in the work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push my comfort boundaries. Uh, I'm gonna go, uh, harder than ever. I'm gonna... Make sure that I get the time that I need to be able to really focus on these hunts. And um, I just couldn't be more excited. I uh, can't wait for this season. And uh, so so I'm just in it now. Uh, preparing, working with that bow, finding a real forgiving tune for that thing. Uh, loving that new Matthews uh, V3X. The thing is shooting. I uh, got the 29-inch this year. Uh yeah, it's just a great bow. Working with some new arrows and trying to figure out a good Western setup for myself, and um, couldn't be more excited. It's uh, it's coming. So uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm stoked. Uh, I'll record a, a solo podcast. I need to do another one of those and just talk about um, just talk about Western hunting and and how to be consistently successful and the work I'm putting in and and. Um, you know, it's like uh, uh, I get to, to, to reap the, the benefits and, um, you know, every season. Uh, consistent success is really difficult. You know, I say it all the time that Western hunting, especially with a bow, is uh, the most challenging endeavor out there. And so to find success year after year when um, success rates, you know, hover at 6 to 20 percent, it is uh, just a testament to the work and the commitment and dedication. And if you really want something and um, you, you put in the effort, it, it's achievable for all of us out there. And uh, case in point is me for sure. So um, thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. And uh, check in with you next week.